everyone. Hi, all the attendees who are attending this session. Today. So we are at our panel session six, that is building an IP team from the ground up, exploring strategy, diversity, and flexibility across the IP landscape. We have our panelists joining in here, Ben Taylor. He is a co-founder principal from Intellectual Resources. Shrikar Ghate, he's an executive director with Blue Tree Capital Group. Ivan Felston, he's a vice general manager and general counsel with Forio Inc. And Michael Sharp, he's a senior legal counsel and head of intellectual property from Aurora Cannabis. So he'll be joining us soon. And the moderator for the session, Smithy Mohan, senior attorney and leader, global innovation and intellectual property strategy done in Bradstreet. Over to you, Smithy. Thank you so much <clears throat> for that introduction. Um, I want to thank my fellow panelists for being here, and I also want to thank the IPR Gorilla for providing us with the opportunity to speak with all of you today. The goal of our discussion today, or as much as we're able to cover in 40 minutes, is to discuss from each of our perspectives the considerations, the issues, and perhaps some of the obstacles in building an intellectual property team for a company, as well as a company-wide IP strategy. There are so many things that need to be considered at large, as well as more in-depth pieces that may be more company specific. And we hope to cover some of that with you today. So to kick off our discussion on building an IP team from the ground up and exploring strategy, diversity, and flexibility across an IP landscape, I want to start with a more general question. And perhaps, Shrikar, you can start by answering this first. Um, in your view, what is the role of the IP team and how does that affect how an IP team is built? Thank you. So to let everyone know a little bit about my background. So I work with an investment fund that invests in early stage companies. And so a lot of our discussion is early on about why you should build an IP team to begin with before you even think about how to do it. And a lot of my focus with these early stage companies is to talk about the, the big why, which is if you're starting a business, your IP team really needs to be focused on how does the IP strategy augment or supplement the business strategy, the overall business goals of the company. So a lot of times we talk to companies and they talk, as they, they talk about wanting to get a patent. They want to sue someone. They want to do things like that. And it's, with, especially with early stage companies, one, you don't have the money. Two, you really don't want to do that. And three, that's not a strategy that really helps the business. It might get you some revenue, it might, it might sound good in the press, but long-term value of these is about tailoring your IP assets, whether it's trademark, trade secret patents, publications, around a, a cohesive strategy that allows you to build value from each of those and understand how much you wanna spend on one versus how much value you're gonna get out of it. Yeah, I think what you said about driving business value is like right on the money. Um, ben, maybe to build off of that, would you perhaps be able to delve a little bit further into how to assess a business and its objectives based on both organizational and market attributes and maybe what considerations should be made from an IP perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Murthy. Um, you know, my my role in this this industry is, has always been from the business strategist side. So um, you know, whenever, whenever I look at, um, you know, helping clients build teams, it often takes into account, um, some of those key components that, that Smurthy mentioned, um, you know, what are the, um, you know, organizational market and competitive dynamics that go into, uh, or play into your business, um, and, and how do you sort of take those into account to build your team? And I think it is imperative to, you know, before you get started and run out and, you know, hire, um, you know, all the great people that you want to bring in, just making sure that you have that opportunity to say, you know, these are the resources that we're, you know, intentionally bringing on, you know, to do these specific things. I've been in a lot of conversations where I hear, you know, somebody say, you know, well, we want to do what IBM is doing, or we want to do what Microsoft is doing. And, and that's all fine from an intentional standpoint. But you know, most of those companies are, are sort of neither the size, you know, nor sort of carry the historical lineage about how they approach IP or in many cases are in completely different markets. Um, so, you know, while the the sentiment is nice, you know, a lot of the matching up and, and how they would actually go about it are, are sort of not, um, 
thoughtfully placed, uh, you know, at least yet. So, um, so I think by, you know, sort of intentionally placing some initial emphasis on, you know, what business are we in? What is our organizational structure? Um, what is our role in our industry? I'll give you a few examples. Um, you know, so if we think about the question of what business are we in, IP considerations for a large technology provider versus a consumer product retailer versus a financial services firm are going to be totally different. You know, the financial services firm is probably dealing with, um, you know, NPEs and a whole class of fintechs that are sort of picking off, you know, experiences that financial service firms have largely, you know, owned almost outright. Um, whereas, um, you know, the consumer products company might be dealing with this uh, kind of emerging trend around how do we, you know, merge our physical products with, you know, digital, you know, how do we bring all that experience to our customers? So, you know, two very different approaches. Um, in terms of like resources, um, you know, when you're thinking about either enhancing or, or building your program, you know, I think one of the challenges I've seen before is, you know, where are you starting with from an executive support standpoint? Um, you know, is this a top down sort of driven um, mandate, you know, by business leaders, or are you trying to sort of, you know, bubble up the function? Um, both can work. Um, you know, I can say from experience that it goes a lot smoother when, you know, the team is sort of formed under the mandate of, you know, we need to build this as part of our business. Um, you know, and, and we sort of fully support the resources and, and all the, um, you know, investment that needs to go into it. Um, and then maybe last, um, in terms of organizational structure, um, you know, I think this is really interesting, right? So whether you're a garage startup or, you know, a supplier with a few offices or a global conglomerate, um, the way your company is situated and structured, you know, are you a siloed organization versus one that's very, um, you know, sort of diverse and, and, you know, you work across those boundaries. Um, you know, another example I've seen in a lot of cases is you have, you know, companies where there is a central business office, but R&D centers are located around the world. Um, you know, and so how do you figure out the resources? How do you place the right resources in those areas to make sure that, you know, all the right ideas, all the right conversations are, you know, funneling not only back to the business, but out to the other areas as it makes sense. Um, so I think, you know, as, as firms start to build out their teams and kind of um, figure out, you know, what types of, you know, legal strategy, you know, communication type resources they need to bring in to really drive success in their program, it just is really beneficial to kind of take that step back first or not take a step back first um, and, and just get that unified perspective. Um, and then from there, you can, you know, start thinking about, you know, goals and capabilities and resources that can all be put into place, uh, you know, to make the program really successful. Yeah, I mean, you covered you covered a really great background. So important to consider so many different factors, the industry, the size of your company, what kind of consumer you're appealing to, just the wide range of factors that, that you mentioned that need to be determined before figuring out how to proceed with building that IP team and strategy. And I think that's actually a great segue into discussing IP strategy in three very different industries. So Mike, you work at Aurora Cannabis, which is a cannabis company that provides various cannabis and hemp products and services, and you develop innovative technologies for that and promote cannabis consumer health and wellness. I, on the other hand, work for Dun & Bradstreet, which provides commercial data, analytics, insights for businesses. Um, we offer a wide range of products and services for risk, finance, operations, supply, sales, marketing, and you know, research and insights on various global business issues. And then we have Evan, who works for Forio, and that is a beauty and well-being um, beauty tech brand is how is how you define yourself with products such as your um, sonic and silicone facial cleansing brush and you have a you know smart mask device that provides a 90 second techno mask LED photo facial treatment and very very different industries these three so given that I think it makes sense at this point in our discussion to take some time to learn a little bit about some of the more unique issues that each of us have faced in building our teams and strategies and what our approaches have been. So Mike, like I mentioned, 
you are in a very interesting new space that speaks directly to some of the considerations that Ben just mentioned. Um, so are there any unique unique issues in your industry with respect to building an IP team? And if so, what are they and how do you overcome them? How are you overcoming them? Yeah, that's great. I appreciate it. And you're, and you're exactly right. It does segue off of, of some of the uh, topics that, that Ben introduced. Um, so I guess one unique issue is that the cannabis sort of has an identity crisis. Um, you know, are we pharma? Are we ag? Are we um, consumer packaged goods? Are we tobacco? Are we alcohol? Um, are we none of the above? Are we all the above? And so it's it's uh, it's tricky to, to to sort of build out the strategy without knowing who you are first. And some of that depends on the regulators involved, the jurisdictions you're in, and, and how you're looked at. So in Canada, on the trademark end, we're looked like we're looked at and regulated like tobacco is in Canada. So that makes it very challenging for us. Um, you know, our roots are really in health and wellness, and so you know we present ourselves as as a, a health and wellness type company, and and our our client base is generally a patient base. That's a you know our medical channels are are quite strong. So um, that's that's a unique aspect of the cannabis industry. Um, another one that probably people would like to hear about is that it's a controversial industry that that presents its challenges. So it's not like um, any other disruptive technology or um, things like crypto or, you know, those have their own controversies. But we have, you know, decades, if not centuries of controversy in cannabis and marijuana, causing a lot of stigma, causing a lot of um, uh, sort of trenched in ideas uh, about what the, the product would be, what the industry would be like. So so that does present the challenge. It did present the challenge in, in building the team. So I, w I was recruited in a couple of years ago. Uh, I should say that I did have cannabis clients prior to that in private practice. Canada has had a medical, a legal medical system for a while and only a, uh, a legal um, nationwide recreational adult cannabis system for a couple of years. So <clears throat> moving into to that space, there, there was a large boom in the industry. Um, I didn't grow up thinking I would work in cannabis. I, uh, I liked uh, my role in private practice I, uh, as well. But um, this company in particular uh, started recruiting a lot of people that, that I knew I had faith in, were business leaders, were legal leaders, were scientific leaders. Um, I did work with them as a client prior to going in-house and built up my confidence in the, the company, the legitimacy, the future of the industry, all of that. So, so even my part of the story um, is part of the building of the team, you know, coming in, um, getting, getting one person in the door. They did have at that time uh, three or four other lawyers, not IP lawyers. And so that, that helped me become comfortable with it. And then uh, going to the next step, uh, we didn't know if we would be looking at recruiting people in or, or putting ads out or whatnot. And so um, we did end up um, putting job postings and, and there was a ton of, of great qualified candidates. Uh, I didn't know what to expect, but um, particularly with IP professionals, they're, they're interested in um, the science, they're interested in the, the challenges around branding, they're interested in the being at the forefront of IP issues, some, some very interesting IP issues that are going to be playing out over the next few years. And so we did get a number of excellent candidates applying. Uh, we did, uh, did end up um, uh, offering and accepting um, positions from a couple of fantastic candidates. And so, so that controversial aspect is, has been uh, an issue but I think it's becoming less of an issue, at least in Canada. You know, as we expand into other jurisdictions, we might face the same the same issues over and over again. But at least we're we're prepared. Uh, and the really convincing people of the medical benefits of the product is is a good way to get the um, I guess what the phrase is the the thin end of the wedge in there and and really recruiting great people. So I think um, I think that's the main point. We do have our our other aspects, but they're similar to what you might have with other startups um, going through growth phase, going through uh, booms and, and busts and things like that. So uh, the main the main issue has been the sort of controversial aspect to the industry, but it's it's becoming less and less so.
Uh, that's that I find everything you just said so interesting because my perspective, um, while you have faced the challenge of building this IP team and, and a practice in this new and like you said, controversial industry, I had the opposite challenge of working in an established industry, not controversial at all in comparison to the cannabis industry. And uh, for a company done in Bradstreet, which is now 180 years old, <laughs> um, but the challenge being to suddenly implement this IP program and strategy um, that's already so, you know, at a company that's that's very well established. And it can be very easy to get overwhelmed in that kind of a situation since you're trying to enter with this startup mindset um, for, for a longstanding company. So um, for me, I think, you know, it was really important to approach that in pieces. Um, first, I had to take a look at what my company was doing from an IP perspective. And, and I think that that's what a lot of people should do when you're trying to implement this new strategy. It's something that you just sort of look at this big umbrella picture and, you know, what is your company doing from that IP perspective? And in many cases, companies may not be doing anything at all. And it's your job to start from scratch. So you need to make several determinations such as, you know, do you have, what kind of portfolio do you have? Do you have any patents? Do you have trademarks? Do you have copyrights? What areas of IP are important to your company? Do you have trade secrets? Um, personally, my company benefits most from patents and trademarks. And at the time that I took over and tried to build this IP program, everything was being handled by outside counsel. So my first action item was to assess our spend and determine which pieces could be brought in house without the help of outside counsel, because obviously, you know, that's a lot of expense. Um, and I think the next step was to ensure that I really developed processes to improve communications with our company's inventors um, to enhance the quality of our patent and trademark applications and encourage more active participation among inventors and our marketing teams and um, hopefully, you know, reduce prosecution and filing costs. So I, I had to kind of look at it at that high level first and then and then I think the next step was to assess our current portfolio to determine what our main patent subject areas were and um, where geographically we had IP protection. And for companies that don't have any protected IP at all, the first step would be to have those conversations with the business to understand what areas you're developing technology in, whether your inventions are patentable, and if so, how to go about um, ensuring that you file for a patent because as many of us know, um, if you're not, if you don't file for a patent, you can't claim rights to that technology. You want to be the first to file for a patent. So I still had to have those conversations because though we had some patents and trademarks when I began building the IP program, there was no focused method to patenting. Um, there was no discussion around what was needed to stand out against our competitors while also focusing on our customers needs and uh, there was no discussion around you know what kind of direction we wanted to take as a company so we had so many different uh, technology and analytics teams and groups and each one was working very individually without cross communicating with one another and so it was important to have those conversations to work together as a company build our common overarching strategy as one team rather than multiple little teams. And ultimately, I think the goal needs to be to continue to seek protection for your company's core capabilities while also evaluating and seizing upon opportunities to expand into new areas that either you see your competitors moving into or there are areas that demand a need based on customer's feedback. And once I think these targets are, these uh, areas are targeted, um, the initial goal should be to, be to to build a defensive portfolio that differentiates your company from its competitors. Um, when I began building the IP program, it wasn't just about who I had on my team and varying levels of expertise, but it was also about ensuring that the proper incentives and the education was provided across the company too. Um, it's really important to educate your teammates on the importance of protecting a company's intellectual property. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not enough to just, you know, work on building the IP and protecting the IP, but you need to 
provide your your company with necessary resources to um, initiate the process for doing so. And it's also important to work with your you know marketing teams and sales teams to know the process to identify product and service names, identify them as trademarked on marketing materials if applicable, and in addition, knowing how to present to third parties when sharing products or services that have either protected IP or patent pending technology and making sure that you are teaching them to share only what should be shared and nothing confidential is included. I know that, you know, our company, we've sometimes had, um, you know, issues with that and, you know, just, just trying to educate the team is, is I think a huge step. In, in building that, that IP strategy and making sure that you implement it correctly. Um, you know, uh, in addition, um, it's not just about education, it's also how are you going to incentivize your inventors to build patent-worthy technology and furthermore take the steps to protect it. A lot of times, you know, job descriptions don't include spending time and effort into filing for a patent application. So as important as it is to build an effective IP team and considerable processes to protect your company's IP, it's equally important to motivate your team to create and protect that strong IP. So Evan, would you perhaps be able to speak a little bit more to um, what characteristics you look for in potential members of an IP brand protection unit compared to when building a more traditional IP focused unit like what Mike or I would have been focused on? Sure. And first, I'd like to add that, Smriti, you should be hosting the Oscars next year. Uh, the, the, the hosting job is, be, is outstanding. So <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, but, you know, I, I'm a little bit different, like, like Smithy just said, and, and I'm a little different than what, what Michael also did, which is, you know, I, I was basically hired on because uh, Freya was a company had exploded, especially in Asia, in 2016. I mean, it went from, you know, small to big, I'll just put it that way. And we ended up seeing an enormous influx of counterfeits, uh, whether it be trademark infringers, patent infringers, um, you know, listings on Amazon, eBay, you know, Alibaba, Taobao, all of these that use our, our copyrighted images. So I was essentially brought on to, to grow the department of, you know, at the beginning it was remove online listings because there were just so many fake and infringing and counterfeit or whatever word you want to use listings that it was essentially, um, you know, very difficult for a consumer to determine what was real and what was not. So I had this task to, to kind of do it on a global scale. When I was brought on, we had a little bit of somebody in China that would do it as sort of, if somebody saw a fake or a listing that, you know, okay, maybe we'll try then and, and very little in Europe, but, but there was nobody at all in the US. So what I had to try and do is A, work with the stakeholders initially, such as our e-commerce people, our sales people, um, our marketing people to determine, hey, let's prioritize, you know, what exactly do we need to do? And at that point, after you're determining, okay, Amazon is the number one priority, um, eBay is the number two priority, XYZ are the next couple priorities. Um, then you have to determine, all right, so who do I bring on? So, you know, due to the the, the size and the sort of um, internal structure of Fereo, we have offices in 15 countries or so. We sell in 80 countries. So as you can imagine, uh, you have to, to split things into regions, right? So in the United States, Canada, I can certainly take care of that. UK, Australia, no problem. However, my Romanian, my Serbian, my, uh, my Mandarin, my Japanese are not up to snuff. I'll be the first to admit. So I had to sort of try and figure out ways that I could localize people or lo find people locally, which is very, very difficult, that would speak these languages and could sort of work on those time zones. I tried a little bit of each in the beginning, but you know, I had to find people in Eastern Europe, like I have somebody in Poland who deals with all of Eastern Europe, uh, somebody in Spain who deals with sort of the Iberian Peninsula, a little bit of France, a little bit of you know, Germany, and, and luckily this person speaks multiple languages. Uh, we have a, a, a large team in China that, that deals with China and Southeast Asia, somebody in Japan who deals with Japan. So you have to sort of build this, this global structure that um, is able to a communicate with one another because you know what you end up seeing is a factory in China produces products that, as you can imagine, are sold to all of the eighty countries that we we sell in, or they're at least sold in half of them, a third of them, some number like that. So you have to sort of uh, create this workflow where you don't have individual silos, like Ben said. You have this cross connection where you know from the top down you're able to sort of cut the snake off at the head, as they say. Um, another thing that you have to to not worry about, but but work with a little bit is. You know, there are some jurisdictions that maybe need somebody to do that, but it's not cost effective. 
um, a particular country would be something like Russia. There are a number of, of, of fakes in Russia. However, our revenue in Russia is not great enough to justify hiring somebody that will do nothing but you know, full-time work with uh, removal of counterfeit products. So then you get to do the really fun thing as a lawyer is to teach the non-legal people what they need to do in terms of the steps. You know, Russia's a good example, Brazil's a good example, Mexico's a good example. Either the revenue is too low or we don't have the IP that covers the products, you know, years and years ago from before I came on board, the IP was never filed, the IP was found as too expensive or we never thought we would be heading into the Brazilian market. So you end up working with the, the non-lawyer section of, okay, you know, I know that you, general manager of this country or a person that the general manager assigns to deal with uh, this on a very part-time basis, you know, five hours a week, 10 hours, a small time basis, um, you know, I'm going to have to sort of walk you through this, this process. You know, for the most part, all of these people go, I've heard of a patent, but I don't really know what it is. So you, you end up uh, acting a little bit like a school teacher and you kind of, and for me, it was interesting. I got to travel around, go to Mexico, go to Brazil, go to Shanghai, go to uh, Zagreb, Croatia, UK, you know, a number of other places and, and um, sort of integrate the processes that I was doing on the legal side as best I could with the um, non-legal people. So, so you end up having to kind of, uh, you know, bifurcate your systems and make it sort of like the advanced version and then sort of the beginner's version that, you know, the beginner's version, they can kind of, you know, collect the data, put it in a form that we need and then figure out a way to take it forward. Uh, the, the other thing that I did that was very helpful was at the beginning, I, I realized that the volume was just so enormous that uh, manually submitting 10,000 uh, Amazon complaints a month was just not worth anybody's time or money. So what we did is start working with outside parties. One of them was, it was Red Points, which I'm not sure if anybody here is familiar with, but it's, it's a, a Barcelona headquartered company that does nothing but sort of um, collect and integrate and quickly uh, remove some of these because of their relationship with the Amazon, the Ebays, the Taobao's. So it sort of was used as like an internal process that, that I created that we could just sort of funnel directly into this external process and they could do the manual work of ensuring that every single uh, you know counterfeit listing I found on Amazon would be reported in a timely manner. So you sort of have to work um, in your own, you know, department or silo for the large markets, you know, U.S. being the largest market that we have, you know, I'm still focusing a lot of my time and making sure that things go, go well here. However, when you're, we're dealing with all of these different languages and different websites, I mean, at the beginning it was, you know, I remember getting on Allegro, a Polish website, and I just could not figure out the system for a while because I did not speak Polish. And you know, I was trying to use the, the translate function on my windows. And it was like, uh, let's just say that the Polish translation in 2016 was not, not as, a uh, good as it is today when you're when you're trying to do that so you end up uh, taking a mix of different things and sort of you know uh, adding them all together and, and adding up to something that involves you know removal of like I said you know 80 plus countries uh, online listings and, and then and then there's a second component which is a little bit more complex not not as interesting to get into but you know there are some places in the world such as Turkey such as again Eastern Europe where people are not buying counterfeits online they're they're you know they're going to the Turkish bazaar. They're going to these small, you know, mom and pop type, web, you know, uh, not websites, uh, shops where they're physically purchasing things. And that makes it even more important that you have somebody on the ground or local because, you know, no matter how hard I tried, I could not remove something from a, a mom and pop store in, in, in Bosnia. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's a very interesting mix and it's, it's something that you need to, need to sort of do a little bit of trial and error, a little bit of aggregation, but you know, there's no panacea. There's not one thing that you can do that will affect all of these markets. It's, it's just sort of the, uh, the aggregate of all the things that you've done in it. And, and, and you have to also be aware that it's a little bit of whack-a-mole. So somebody's, you know, somebody's selling on eBay, then all of a sudden you shut it down. And then a week later, their brother is selling on eBay and you can tell that it's coming from the same address, the same shipping, the same this, the same that, same a assets that they're using on their eBay, eBay page. And, uh, you know, the, the new account's now my brother's name. So, I mean, it's just sort of a, a little bit of everything, but it's, it's been a very interesting experience for me. That, that's incredible. It, it's, I mean, so many things you touched on sounds so... Um interesting really and and actually i you know it, it brought up some extra questions that maybe i'll open it up to everybody to kind of jump in and and answer uh, i mean i know evan just touched on, on on some of what he does but how do you evaluate new ip team members when when looking to build that ip team and you know that support companies um business objectives um anyone want to jump in on that I can take a look at it more from a broad side. So you just heard from everyone on the panel. 
an IP team is really less about the individual IP strengths, but you know, as Ben and I talked about, it's about business. As uh, Smriti talked about, it's about uh, education. It's about global strategy, as Michael talked about. It's about marketing and policing, as Evan talked about. Your IP team takes on a much more general uh, skill set than, say, a law firm's IP team. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I, I would agree with that as, as well, um, maybe for a, a different reason, you know, with priority shifting and um, the industry changing and uh, uh, the consumer changing, being more educated, it, it, people have to be quite well, well rounded. And so that's, yeah. that's what I was looking for my team members. I, you know, not someone who could just do patent prosecution or could just do this or that, but they, they have to have a good sense. They have to, um, you know, have some of these other skills that, that were just mentioned. They have to be a good educator and, you know, they have to be good working with all the internal stakeholders so um you know quite well-rounded comprehensive uh can were the best for me yeah i i i think you you hit you hit on exactly what i was thinking too well -roundedness. <laughs> and and um you know it doesn't have to be that the person checks off every single item on your job description necessarily but you know it's important that Yes, they have to have the substantial knowledge, but at the same time, that communication with the business stakeholders and being able to dip into so many different areas, that, that, that is so important. And I see the same thing on my end in my company. Yeah, I'll just quickly add, I mean, I, I always find it funny when I see an ad for um, like a head of IP or, you know, a strategic IP manager. I mean, it, it is the laundry list of, you know, you have to have the legal background. You have to have the insights background. You have to be able to communicate with stakeholders. You need to be able to hire people. I mean, it, it is insane um, because I, you know, I, I think this area is still very um, ambiguous to a lot of the rest of the organization. It's not quite clear, you know, all the time, like all the moving pieces and stakeholders that need to be, you know, attended to through an IP group. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've seen some of the larger you know, groups that I've worked with that, you know, sort of have that core, you know, legal function in place that are now able to go out and, um, you know, if, if a lot of times the hiring is sort of aligned with, well, what stage are we actually at in our program? You know, so if, if you know, it took us a couple of years to kind of get things, things off the ground and now we're trying to really ramp up, um, you know, the size of our portfolio or, you know, investigation into a specific area, you know, they have the flexibility to kind of go out and hire, you know, either, you know, those with a legal background, but also a propensity to go out and help others create, you know, I think a lot of it depends on, you know, are you, are you an organization that has, you know, a large, you know, R&D organization that has sort of that natural propensity to invent, or are you, for instance, like an insurance firm, you know, which all of a sudden, you know, maybe has some reason to get into more active patenting, but you're working with this large group of people that don't have that natural inclination to invent. Um, and so maybe you have to kind of align your resources based on, you know, at any given time. I think the communication thing to me is huge too, Smurthy. Um, I mean, it's just, you know, once this gets going, creating that awareness and that momentum, you know, recognizing people in, in a variety of ways for their contributions, um, you know, just has that snowball effect to not only growing the team and the program, but just, you know, the contributions that come from, from the organization itself. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I guess maybe to kind of build off of that, you know, what you just said about recognition. Uh, I know I touched on it earlier when I spoke, but um, in terms of culture and awareness, um, how do all of you build awareness and support for an IP program? How do you grow engagement beyond, you know, the, the core teams and, um, where, you know, wherever you expect the most activity, beyond where you expect the most activity to be generated from? Um, and how do you go about recognition and reward practices? Basically, what are your, what are, what are your takes on culture and, and awareness? So in terms of awareness, I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, you know, as I said, I, I came in and, and there really was not an IP attorney like in this whole company globally. So it was uh, sort of the, uh, the classic uh, hold the carrot out a little. Hey, look, like I can remove these fakes. And, and but you guys need to kind of help me a little bit. But, you know, I can make, you know, salespeople. I'll make your lives a little bit easier. Marketing people, you won't have questions anymore. 
you know, of people reaching out to our social media team saying, wait a second, I thought this was a real product and I bought this and it stopped working after three days. You know, hey, engineering team, like, you know, do you want more patents in your name that, that you can sort of, you know, uh, be happy and brag about and we have sort of internal rewards for that kind of thing. Uh, E-commerce team, do you want to clean up our Amazon pages and not have 14 different resellers or or not? So, I mean, it's, it's you have this um, sort of culture and awareness of, you know, at the beginning, everybody's a little bit averse to change. But um, over time, it became, hey, it was, mine's very easy. You can see the benefits immediately when you have 14 resellers on day one and then three months later, you have just yourself on your Amazon page. I mean, that that's so clearly evident to everybody that, that it's you know pretty helpful. I think the the longer tail stuff is like um, you know the the R and D side in terms of you know making sure that we protect more things than we used to. You know, prior to me being here, it was we'll file in China, the U.S., and the EU, and now we're filing in like 10, 12 countries because you know people are now understanding. Okay, you know, just because we we didn't used to file in this country means that we're going to have an influx of, of fakes in a different country. But you know you're you're able to sort of you know a rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing when you're making it more and more difficult for infringers to start selling in places that you are uh, or are not quite frankly even if we don't have an office there if we're going to still protect some ip there um you know it it really hamstrings them in terms of you know increasing their revenue and it's pretty easily easily evident in our bottom line what happens yeah you know we're trying to trying to make ip exciting and uh and we have monthly um, meetings with what we call our IP liaisons, so representatives in different departments, different areas of the company, different uh, jurisdictions in some cases. And uh, it has an educational component. It has some, you know, business business parts of it. And uh, you know, we we try to make it exciting and enjoyable for everyone, so that they go out and spread the word that. Uh, that IP is important, IP is interesting, IP is fun. We all know this stuff, uh, but maybe not everybody in the world does yet. Um, uh, so, so that's been helpful, but there's still work to do. So, so a lot of buy-in from R&D, a lot of buy-in from science, a lot of buy-in from marketing and branding. Um, you know, more work to be done in those non-core groups, as you as you frame them, with uh, with finance, with operations, with with these these sort of groups. It's been a little more uphill. But um, you know we we just stick with it. We're we're gonna do you know something fun for World IP Day coming up in a few weeks. Um, you know we look at opportunities like that just to to connect with people and, and give them a bit of information, tell them some interesting stories. Yeah, that's great. I think that really um, helps build the culture of the company as well. Um, uh, one more, um, just one quick note, quickly. I know one thing that sort of has historically been a notion in a lot of firms and, and, I've, and it doesn't seem to work anymore is just this notion of it's part of your job. <laughs> and it may be true, but it just, you know, it's kind of the world we live in today, everything is really about, you know, a value exchange as it should be. And, and I find that that has translated over into this area too, where if I'm going to spend additional time, you know, it doesn't have to be a huge reward, you know, it, even just the little recognition goes so far. That's, you know, that's an excellent point. I think, you know, when we're talking about recognition and reward practices, uh, a lot of people think of rewards as something that that's monetary and it doesn't have to be monetary. It, you know, yeah, sure. A lump of extra cash from your company for developing valuable IP is, is nice to have, but oftentimes people just want to be acknowledged for their contributions and know that what they're doing makes a difference. So, you know, many companies, especially as we're going through this pandemic, um, maybe on a budget, you know, many companies are facing some cost cutting scenarios. So it doesn't have to be monetary at all. Rewards can be as simple as some FaceTime with your CEO or, you know, a certificate of recognition and an announcement at your company's next town hall. You know, something like that makes people feel like a valued member of the team and feeling like contributions that they make are valued and can and that can really be a huge motivational factor when thinking about developing an incentive program. So, you know, that's really important to consider in terms of culture and awareness, definitely. I think what we see with a lot of our smaller companies is just getting people to think of IP beyond patents. So when once you get people to start thinking about thinking about customer lists, know-how, ways you market, all these other things, and once you start getting other people realizing that whatever they do as part of their job is part of the IP of the company and is important to the company and is recognized as being important, that's when I think you start to see a lot more buy-in from everyone 
more so than you can get just by giving monetary rewards. Yeah. I've always found that if you can show something that's a tangible benefit, like, you know, hey, you know, R and D team or hey, sales sales team, you know, keep me involved if you see something because, you know, like I, the easiest example is, you know, a patent infringer that is sold that you know, I just took one out of a, a major retailer. And it's sort of like your job is now easier because your competition is gone. I mean, I think it's sure. that direct, like, yeah. here is the benefit if you, you know, follow the procedure. I mean, that, that to me is, you know, people internally, and maybe at the end it turns into money. I had a better year this year, so therefore I get more money at the end of the year because I had less competition, so I sold more. But it's, um, it's, it's that sort of like, do I see a benefit in doing this? You need to clearly show what that benefit is, in my opinion. So I'm seeing in the chat that we have five more minutes in the session. So I want to be mindful of time. Um, first of all, I think, uh, you know, I want to thank all of you. I think we covered a lot in a very short amount of time and, and I wasn't expecting that. So it's fantastic. Um, I think, you know, in conclusion, it would be great if we all took a moment to maybe offer what you think is the most important takeaway for our audience. And maybe we go in alphabetical order and Ben, you can, you can start us off. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I think my key takeaway is, is, um, or maybe the the key message is uh, just that some you know upfront investment to um, you know sort of unify perspectives and build consensus around you know the business you are in, your organizational structure and capabilities, um, you know, and sort of the role you play in your market. Essentially, just getting a clear understanding of where we're starting from. Um, really goes a long way to help define the resources that um, you know you, you need to bring in to either you know build or enhance uh, your IP team. Mm -hmm. That's great, Evan. Uh, for me, it would it would be sort of clearly elucidate the value of doing something. I mean, to me, that's the, like I said, the, the the carrot or the you know the worm on the hook is, you know, how are you you know person X going to benefit from getting involved in this IP process? And and if I can clearly show how this person will benefit then um, you know, people then become invested in, in what you're trying to accomplish. Mike? Thanks, yeah, I, I would add um, you know, for people to be patient, you know, stick with it. Um, you'll get to where you wanna be with the people you want and the resources you want. Um, you know, be your own champion, be your group's champion, and, um, and, and don't panic if things don't happen right away. You know, the things might take time, but you'll get there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think from my perspective, I would say that there are overall three critical elements to building a comprehensive IP strategy, protection, optimization, and monetization. At a basic level, you wanna protect your IP and you need to figure out how best to do that for your company. Second, you need to optimize your processes, build a flexible forward thinking strategy that truly guides those within your company through each stage of innovation and protection, um, all the way from inception of an idea to obtaining the patent or trademark or other form of protected IP and ultimately managing your IP portfolio. And you wanna use that strategy to optimize how you approach this and um, assess cost saving and you know cost savings and invest in the right tools and processes that allow you to maximize your budget and allocate your resources with confidence. And finally, when you've built enough of a foundation with protection and optimization, you wanna monetize your assets. And ultimately your goal is to ensure your strategy contributes enough value for your organization and improves your ability to identify infringers. So again, op protect, optimize, monetize. Shrieker? Yeah, and I'll follow that up with just Make sure that that strategy is well documented and well described to the, to the decision makers. Because once you do those three things, then once you promise those three things and once they explain it, once you can tie it back to the business value, the IP team looks less like a cost center and more like a value driver. And it gets you a lot more buy-in across the board. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, everyone. I think, I think um, that concludes our panel are there any questions so attendees do we have any questions for the session so they can write down on the chat box on the right or they can join face to face and speak to our speakers directly so in the meanwhile uh, uh smithy if you would like to conclude the session as a whole so any one or two points that you would like
I think, you know, I think the team did a great job of sort of summarizing their key key takeaways just now. I think, um, you know, there are just so many, so many aspects in building an IP team and an IP strategy. But, you know, we really, uh, you know, want to want to emphasize that, you know, it's, it's really just approaching it piece by piece. And, um, you know, each industry is different. Each geography is different. And it's important to assess all of that and start from the ground up and build it and and that's that's it yeah <laughs> oh, that's fabulous so uh we have a comments from heather bovin that is excellent job to everyone very insightful amanda says thank you and rose says very comprehensive and excellent description of how to build an ip practice it's a compliment for you all Good. thank you well, uh, let's have a smiley screenshot. Uh, in the meanwhile, if you have any questions, they can drop down on the chat box. So uh, let's take away some memories from this session and for this conference. Let's have a smiley screenshot. And backstage team, please do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rupi, for moderating a wonderful session. Thanks, Ivan, Speaker, Ben, and Michael today and making me successful for the IP Agola virtual IP conference. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us.